tonight. All right, I um, want to get right into recapping a little bit of what we talked about. This series is called Elevating Your Worship Experience. And last week, you know, we kind of hit a number of points that I just kind of want to jump off uh, with today. One is that worship is a verb. We're talking about worship, and worship is a verb. Worship is not something you watch. It's not something, it's not a spectator sport. It's not something that is for some people and not for others. Uh, worship is a verb. So because worship is a verb it's, and something we do, we can evaluate our worship experience. We can talk about it and kind of analyze it and look at it and, and see if we're actually worshiping the way uh, we're called to and with, with the spirit that we are to engage in it. Jesus redefined worship in the New Testament by saying that worship must be in spirit and truth. <clears throat> Two very, very important words there. And the Father seeks such to worship him, those who worship in spirit and truth. God is not looking for worship. There's lots of that on the planet. You know, if you think of human history, human history is not filled with atheism. Human history is filled with people who worship something. The question is, what did they worship? And in most cases, <clears throat> people did not worship or know the living God. But people are worshipers by definition. And I'll, I'll just kind of throw this at you. The, um, <clears throat> the, if you want to know what worship is, it is the object of your life's most intense focus. You can analyze yourself what you are worshiping by, by identifying what uh, is, the, is the object of your life's most intense focus. For some people, it could be a career, it could be money, it could be a house, it could be their properties, their material things, it could be a person you know, that they elevate, that their most intense focus is on that person or on trying to achieve something or whatever and on and on and on and on and on. Could be on that new truck you bought, you know, <laughs> um, what, whatever, or the old truck you bought. But, but everybody is a worshiper. Yes. Even people who say they're atheists, they have a, a life's most intense focus that they pour their affection on, that they love, that they adore, that they literally will do anything for. That's worship. God desires, uh, or God, God's desire and intention is to bring us into his presence through worship. Worship is designed to usher us into the very presence of God. And in his presence is fullness of joy. You know, if you, like me, many, many years ago, I, you know, I, I went to church. I remember actually going to a church in this area. I won't name where it was, uh, but it was in a town around here. <clears throat> and... Um, Someone's who, who belonged to our church, who was a partner in our church, their mother, I believe, if I remember right, died. And she was part of this church all her life. And I went to the funeral. I remember sitting and watching these people. At one point, they went up and had uh, the Eucharist or communion. I guess I probably gave it away. And uh, <clears throat> they were coming back. I was just looking at them. And I couldn't see one person who had any sense of joy. In fact, they all had a very morbid, kind of mournful look on their face. And I've seen that in some places, that you know, people going into church, coming out, looking like they were baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> and I think, who are you worshiping? In his presence is fullness of joy. And you should right now be more full of joy than when you came through the door because you've just been in the presence of Jesus. You still are. It doesn't stop when we stop singing. But the point is, is that you know, worship is designed to usher you into his presence. And there should, be, there should be a lift. There should be something that is going on on the interior that is lifting you and causing you to experience his presence. So worship in spirit means that it has to emanate from our spirit and be spiritual. 
we relate to God in and through the Holy Spirit. When we receive Christ and are born again, it's our spirit that, that the Holy Spirit indwells. And then on top of that, uh, the Holy Spirit also fills or overflows our spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we see in the book of Acts, very early in the book of Acts. Now, when Jesus, the, the, the passage that we pulled a lot of that out of, those opening points, was found in John chapter four, where Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman. And incredibly enough, that's where Jesus, to this, this Samaritan woman, who had five husbands and now had a live-in, it was to her that Jesus unpacked amazing teaching and really more understanding on worship than he did in any other context. So uh, it's, it, you, know, you really see a picture of the grace of God, that he comes to us when we least deserve it. And uh, he begins to talk to us. How many know that Jesus is the one who initiated your, the relationship that you now have? It wasn't you. Even if you think it was you, it wasn't. <clears throat> And so Jesus says to her, you know, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And uh, one commentary on this talked about Christ was the center of these worshipers and about him was gathering the discipleship of true worship, of the true worship. The hour is and the, and the hour comes. True worshipers are not so called for being beforehand worshipers in spirit and truth, but they are such as become so under the Christian revelation. In other words, it's not until Jesus arrives and reveals himself to people that they have the ability to become the true worshipers. And so the true worshipers are, are distinguished not only from hypocrites, but also from all worshipers before Christ whose worship was necessarily imperfect. So all those offerings and everything that you see in the Old Testament, they were designed to you know, bring people uh, into God's presence, but God accepted them even as imperfect as they were. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of goats and, and bulls was unable to cleanse our conscience to serve the living God. It was unable. God accepted it, but it was unable to perfect us and to really cleanse our conscience. So Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, do not marvel that I say you must. So when Jesus says this is a must, how many know he's not making a suggestion? He's saying you must be born again. I wish that, you know, I wish, well, I don't know. It might not have made any difference. But I was gonna say, I wish that this was taught to me when I was a little kid. That someone told me I must be born again. Um, that, that wasn't included in the menu of the religious instruction I had. And so I didn't understand that I had to be born again. I just, I just thought this is it, you know, this, this is it, and it doesn't get any better. And so I decided to check out. But unless a man is born again, so what, what is that really saying? Until the Holy Spirit indwells, all we can do is feebly grasp and grope in the darkness after God. It's like you have a blindfold on, and you know, you're like a blind dog in a meat house. You can sniff there's something out there, but you don't know where it is. And I think that describes a lot of people. You know, a lot of people lose out, miss out on what God is doing because they don't understand that they must have the Holy Spirit. They must have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't perceive the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God could be moving here this morning, God's Spirit, Jesus present, doing things. And someone who does not have the Holy Spirit is like, well, I don't know what the big deal is. I don't even know why these people are excited. Why are they clapping and kind of, you know, why are they doing this? 
Well, they're doing it because they're born again. And they are communing with God in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in them is getting excited. And they're sensing his presence. And they're excited about it. Amen? So you must be born again. You must be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit is in us by believing in Christ and following him, the Spirit enables us, empowers us, and activates us into becoming those who worship in spirit and truth. But that has to happen. Jesus says, the hour now is. Because prior to this, all people were encumbered in relating to God in the spirit. All people were encumbered. They just, they, they you know, they wanted to, they might have had a desire to, uh, but they could not really connect fully. And so Paul, even in, in uh, describing the kingdom of God to uh, the Romans, you know, he's writing a letter to the Romans, and Paul had never been to Rome, but he'd heard about what was going on there. And in Rome, there was, there was Jewish believers and there was Gentile believers. And Nero, for a period of time, uh, expelled all the Jews from Rome. But then, um, you know, they were allowed back afterwards, after a period of time. And so now the church uh, at Rome had uh, both Gentiles, non-Jewish people like us, or at least most of us here, I imagine, and... Um, and they had Jewish believers. And so they were stumbling over each other, they were offending each other, because the Jews said, oh, you can't eat this, and you can't eat that, and you gotta observe this day, and you need to be circumcised, by the way, and da 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 And the, the Gentiles just kinda went, who cares? We'll eat anything. And we're not interested in your special days. And we're definitely not getting circumcised. <laughs> and so there was this tension in that church. And so Paul was writing, if you read uh, the, the chapter surrounding, he's writing, kind of settle this and say, hey, look, <clears throat> don't destroy your brother because of your meat. You know? And he's appealing to both sides. But finally, he sums it up by saying, the kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what the kingdom is really all about is establishing you in righteousness through the cross. Hello? Through the cross and through the resurrection of Jesus and peace that comes because of righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is that place of domain where the Spirit of God rules. And the kingdom of God can be in you, and you can be in the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul kind of hits on this thought again about the Holy Spirit, and he says, our sufficiency is from God, who has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Paul, when in referring to the letter, he, he's, what he's talking about is um, the law of the Old Testament, and he's saying you know, it's not because of the commandments, it's not because you know, we keep the commandments and, and we've kept them perfectly, and because of that, now God has you know, approved us and, and allowed us to move in the power of the Holy Spirit so we can preach the gospel and do signs and wonders and miracles and healings and all these wonderful things that we see Paul doing. Um, he's saying, no, um, it's not of the letter. It's not because of the letter. How many know that, that what you have in Christ isn't because of your ability to keep the law? The, the law was given to us, not that there was something wrong with the law, but there was something wrong with us. And the law was given to us as, as an expression of the holiness of God, but when we kind of ran into the law, we might have been able to keep you know, one or two for a little while, but then, then we'd fail. And we kept, we kept running into that perfect law and we kept falling short. And so Paul says, well, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, teaching us that, look, if you're trying to establish your own righteousness by the keeping of the law, 
you're never, ever, 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 ever going to be able to do it. So it's not of the letter, but of the Spirit, capital S. It's the Holy Spirit. And he says, for the letter kills. What? What are you saying? You're saying the law kills people? God's going around killing people with the law? No, God meant the law to be life, but we couldn't live up to it. And so it killed us. The law kept killing people. Why? Because they could not live up to the law. How many of you have perfectly kept the law that says thou shalt not steal? Put up your hand, and if you do, I'll cast the lying spirit out. <clears throat> you know, I don't see anybody's hand going up. Why? Because, you know, we've all stolen something, haven't we? You know, hopefully it's not your neighbor's wife, but nevertheless, <clears throat> um, The law upheld the righteousness of God, but it was killing us. And so it brought us to Christ, who is life. And the Spirit gives life. Now, if I was to ask you, why did Jesus die? In fact, if I was to ask most Christians today, why did Jesus die? I'm almost certain that over 90% of them would say the same thing. They'd say, he died for my sins. And probably most of you would say that too. But that's actually not why Jesus died. <laughs> of course, the blood of Jesus came to atone for sins. But it didn't end there. Because then he was buried and he was raised in, in power and he was raised in resurrection life. And Paul says in Romans 8, it's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know, so in other words, Jesus died, shed his blood to take care of the sin problem in order to position you and I to receive the fullness of the spirit. Yeah, that's what it's all about. The Christian life is about it being in Christ, in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the third, you know, weird uncle of the Trinity. Like many, unfortunately, there's still a whole whack of churches out there that don't teach on the Spirit. But the Spirit is where it's at. Paul says, look, it's not... My sufficiency is from God, and he's made me a sufficient minister of the new covenant, not because of the letter or my own righteousness, but because of the spirit of life. The spirit gives life. The spirit animates us. And so the space, if I can use that term, that you and I are to occupy as Christians is in Christ, in the spirit. In Christ, in the spirit. And so if we are to really actuate our spiritual growth and, and our knowledge of God, we must be people who are in Christ and of the spirit. We cannot know God according to the five senses. You will never be able to smell him, touch him, see him. Can't remember what the other ones are. But here... here yeah, like the audible voice of God. You're, you're not, that's not gonna happen. Some people claim it, but I've never heard an audible voice. But I'll say this. It's in the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that animates our spirit. And that his indwelling and his infilling empowers us to worship Christ in the Spirit. And we know him in and through the Spirit. So we have to understand that in order to worship in spirit and truth, the way Jesus said the Father is seeking such to worship him, that it is a result of the Holy Spirit filling us and indwelling us. So as you think of your Christian experience, you can ask yourself this question. Am I indwelt by the Holy Spirit? If you are, that's good. But there's more than that. 
have I been filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit? You know, um, honey, would you pass me that bottle of water, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Beside the fact that I <clears throat> want to drink, when people are baptized in water, we have a baptismal tank under here, and uh, we fill it up with water. Water <clears throat> is the element that people are baptized in. We put them in the tank, we drop them all the way down, and then we bring them up, and they're baptized in water. I remember one uh, really wonderful brother who uh, was a deacon here for many years, and he looked at the baptismal tank to go in, he said, Pastor, I don't think there's enough water in there to cleanse all my sins. <clears throat> I said, well, Water is just the element, but it's Jesus who is cleansing you as you are obedient to him in the waters of baptism. So water is the element. You're baptized into water. But in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the element. And Jesus takes you and immerses you in the Spirit. And you, there's an overflow it's not just the indwelling, it's now the infilling. Yes. And so you are spirit-filled, and hopefully over time, you become spirit-formed. Yes. Yeah, yes. so this is a process here that we're talking about. Yes. But going back to the passage that we looked at in John chapter four, Jesus was speaking to this woman, and they were, you know, she was locked in on the natural. She was thinking, you know, I came here to get water with my bucket and we start talking about this well and we're talking about water, but Jesus is trying to pierce through her natural thinking and elevate her into the realm of the spirit. He has a spiritual message for her, but she's locked into this natural uh, thinking and he's you know, he's trying to get her out of it. And he says to her, Jesus answered and said, well, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Just, you know, just like this. I mean, literally, drink of this water. I drink of this water, but you know, one drink of that water is not going to satiate me for the rest of my life, right? But Jesus says to her, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting or eternal life. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but the point is, is that what's really important to understand is that when, when Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, it satiates the very deepest need in our spirit and in our soul. That people are running around, just as I was for many years, trying to find something to pack in to that, that vacuum, that need, uh, that vacuity of my spirit, that emptiness in my soul, and just trying to get something to satisfy the hunger and the longing and deep desire that we all have as human beings to experience something more. What is life all about? Right. You ever find yourself thinking about that? Yeah. Well, Jesus said, this is what it's all about. I created you, and now I'm calling you so that I can fill you with living water that becomes within you a spring that, that will literally, like a fountain, it will spring up into everlasting life. If you keep drinking of that water and you allow that, the Spirit of the Lord, to come in and fill you and just keep following the, the flow, it will bring you into eternal life with God forever where this world and all its pain, all its ugliness, all its sorrow, all its struggles will be gone and you will be in the presence of the living God who loves you and died for you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I could say that until eternity. That's kind of what it's like. It never ends. 
everlasting life. And of course, Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. And for the sake of clarity, John records this again in his gospel later on in chapter seven, verse 37, and he tells where Jesus was at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, and there he is in the city of Jerusalem, that city that is still there, uh, where there's all kinds of war and everything else going on over there. Jesus stood in the streets of Jerusalem in the temple, and it was the, it was the great day of the feast. It was the final day of the feast. And Jesus stood and cried out to the thousands who were there. And he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. This is so important to understand. It's, it's, it's basic, but it's really important. Jesus wants you to come to him, a person. He doesn't say, come to a set of rules and regulations. He doesn't say, come to this building or that building. He says, come to me. Come to me. Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. And he wants to love on you and he wants to fill you. But he says, come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In John 4, he spoke of a fountain that springs up. Here he says, it will be in him. If you come to me and you drink of me, the water that I give you, it will, it will be, it'll flow out of your heart like rivers of living water. I think some Christians, sometimes, uh, you know, we get in, whether, whether we like to admit it or not, we just get into um, places where we forget some basic concepts. That's why it's good to preach this from time to time. He said, the Holy Spirit will flow out of you. And I think most of us are concerned in the Holy Spirit flowing into us. Well, listen, if you've been filled with the Spirit, he's not gone anywhere. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's there. But what you might need to do is keep coming back to Jesus to drink. But the, the, it's important to understand that he said this will be a river and rivers that will flow out of you. And that's how we are salt and light in our world. That's how the kingdom is advanced is because we don't put a stop on the flow. You know, we, we get filled up and then we just put a plug in there in our spirit and make sure we don't, wanna, we don't wanna lose a drip. So we just keep it to ourselves. Listen, you know what? Over the years, I have been in places where there's a lot of inflow and there's not very much outflow. And you call that a swamp. And they stink to high heavens. They just stink. And you know there's some swampy Christians? Oh, where have you been? And there's some swampy churches. There's never any outflow. And they're swampy. You get in there and you, it just doesn't smell very good. And again, you know, obviously I'm not talking about a natural smell. I'm just talking about the condition. People have become swamp people. Swamp Christians. Because there's no outflow. But he says this river will be in you and it will flow out of your heart. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, capital S, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross, but he was telling them, come to me and drink. And what I'm going to do is, is uh, if you believe in me and you follow me and put your trust in me uh, and come to me, I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm going to the cross, I'm gonna die, my blood will be shed, not spilt. You know, if, if you spill something, you just kinda, oops, and it's spilt. It's an accident. Jesus was not accidental about dying on the cross. 
It was no accident. He was no accident going somewhere to happen. It was purposeful. It was intentional. His blood was shed, and he shed his blood, and he went to the cross. He was glorified when he was raised from the dead. So the Holy Spirit was not yet given, but we see uh, that he says it's going to be given. And in John chapter 14, again, book of John, just keeps coming back to this theme of the Holy Spirit. And John uh, writes in chapter 14, he says, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Another means another like what you already have. Jesus was the helper. He said, I'm out of here pretty soon and I'm gonna give you another helper. Someone just like me. Right? That he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. In other words, they have not been born again. They don't understand. They don't see. They think you're just, you know, if you're a Christian, they just think you're hung up on religion. They don't understand that God has put the Holy Spirit in you and you are alive on the inside. He says, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. That's the key. Right now, he's, he's with you. He's telling his disciples, he's with you. And that's why you can pray for the sick and heal the sick and do all that kind of stuff. But there's gonna come a time when the Holy Spirit is gonna be in you. Now, Jesus calls all his disciples then and today to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit, to live the Christian life, to be, to be worshipers that the Father is seeking and to have the ministry of reconciliation, to be salt and light to the world. How can we do that without the power of the Holy Spirit? How can we make any impact without the power of the Holy Spirit? It's impossible. And as you know, you know, I, <clears throat> I do a fair amount of traveling. I've done all the years that I've been here, and also uh, for several years before I came here, traveled full-time in ministry, traveling all over the place, across both ponds and coast to coast in Canada. And one thing I noticed is that churches that promote and teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's something very different about them. If they teach it and promote it. Because once you get people filled, you, it's like it takes on a life of, of its own. You can't stop them. Quite frankly, that's one reason I'm not a big believer in advertising. We don't spend a nickel on advertising in this church. And over the years, I think we've had our phone, our phone number in the yellow pages. I'm not even sure we do that anymore. We, we just don't advertise. Why? You don't want people to come? No, I want people to come. But the greatest advertisement is spirit-filled people. People who've experienced God. People who've gotten healed at this altar. People who've gotten saved at this altar. People who've come from death to life and they know now the reality of the new life of Christ in them. Guess what? You can't stop them. They are going to go and they're gonna yak. Or they're gonna pray for somebody and that person will get healed. Or they're gonna share the gospel. Or they're gonna do something because the well is in them now. And they're gonna tell other people and they bring other people and those other people come and they experience God. And the church grows. You know, when we came here 24 years ago, there was 30 people in the church. 30 people. And this building was here. We were in this building. 30 people in this building every Sunday morning. And after a month, there was 26. And after another month, there was 24. And so Jan and I looked at each other one day, did the math and said, well, we'll be going home by June because we were living upstairs. Because you can imagine a church of 30, there wasn't a lot of paycheck. I had a lot of week at the end of my paycheck. <clears throat> Didn't get that, did you? Okay. Um, so, so, you know, it's like, how did this happen that we're in two full services every Sunday morning? Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. It's not because of me. It could have been anybody. 
It's not because me and Jan, it's because the Holy Spirit, you cultivate an atmosphere where people can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you get people filled with the Holy Spirit, they're unstoppable. It's ingenious. That's what God planned. So, there's two things that people need in order to become spirit and truth worshipers. They, everybody needs a truth encounter, and everybody needs a power encounter. Spirit and truth. You have to have a truth encounter. The truth has to confront your life. To, 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 to think that you're not going to have a truth encounter. Jesus always, always, always confronted people with the truth. And if they didn't, they weren't ready to buy in, he, you know, that was it. He didn't chase them. He didn't run after them. He just spoke truth to them. Those who bought in, then he released a power encounter. The power encounter is what transforms your life. The power encounter is what transforms. You know, the early disciples heard Jesus say, go and preach the gospel to every nation, making disciples of every nation. Go. It was what we call the Great Commission. Go, go, go. Everybody, no, no longer just Jewish people, all nations, go preach the gospel. And so they were kind of ready to go and do that, but then funny thing happens in, in a post resurrection encounter with Jesus, he, the disciples, he's meeting with them. It's recorded in Acts chapter one. It says, and being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, in his resurrected state, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. He said, well, Lord, we thought you said to go. Not so fast. But he says, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with? But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when we baptize people in water, water is the element. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is the element. And Jesus takes you and immerses you in the spirit. He empowers you. And when we know that when the Holy Spirit fell on these, there was 120 waiting, uh, as they were waiting on God for some time, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all began to speak with tongues and magnify God. They, were all, they all received, they were all filled, not just the apostles, not just the big wigs, not just the big guns, Every disciple was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, interestingly enough, in Acts chapter eight, it says a, a persecution arose and the disciples were scattered. And it says, except the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem. So all the people went, they were scattered all over the place because of persecution. And you know what it says? It says they went everywhere preaching the word. Who was preaching the word? Just, just the rank and file. People like you and like the people sitting beside you. Are you preaching the gospel? Are you opening your mouth? Are you sharing gospel, Christ with people and sharing the good news of his kingdom? That's what happened. They were filled with the spirit and the well was overflowing and they did not stop it. They did not put the plug in, and become swamp people. And so Paul writes to them later in 1 Corinthians when he's established the church in Corinth because the gospel was, went viral and there was churches being planted all over the Mediterranean basin. And Paul writes to the church that he planted at Corinth and he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ, which is a reference to the spirit of prophecy, was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift so this church was full of the gifts of the Spirit in operation. They had utterance. They had knowledge. It was all operating. In fact, it was proliferated. And Paul actually, later on, in this same letter, writes three chapters 
chapter 12, 13, 14, addressing the Holy Spirit's gifts, enumerating them, and bringing teaching and instruction on them and on the love of God in, through which they're to operate. So Paul is, is all over this, teaching them that they, they, uh, they're filled with the Spirit and to continue that, and, and, but to bring it into order and make sure it's all done properly and right. But his concern was always that they would be filled with the Spirit. When you read through the book of Acts, you'll find that Paul, every time he encountered believers, he asked them one question. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Why? Because Paul knew that that was the game changer. That was the game changer. There's only one issue. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus went to heaven and said, I will pour out my Spirit upon you. And so it's like someone going to Vancouver and saying, when I get to Vancouver, I'll send you my tie and you'll know that I arrived. So what happens is a week later, something shows up in the mail and you open it, and it's the guy's tie. Well, you know he got there. Well, we know that Jesus got to the Father because the Holy Spirit arrived. And the Holy Spirit filled all the believers, all the believers. Listen, being Spirit-filled and everything that accompanies that, whether it's tongues, whether it's healings, whether it's miracles, whether it's prophecy, whether it's words of knowledge, whatever those things are, that is normal Christianity. Not abnormal, not exceptional, not, well, we don't do that in my church. Well, then your church is missing out on the whole idea of New Testament Christianity because Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. And from what I understand, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have been told that that word in Ephesians, where Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a continuous sense. In other words, it would be, a, a better translation would say, be being filled. It's an ongoing sense, because the well is in you. It's now in you. So let that work of the Spirit overflow in your life continually, continually. And you know what? When you do that, that will absolutely radicalize your worship. Yeah. And my burden as a pastor, the reason you say, well, why are you preaching this? Seems to me we had a pretty good worship service. Well, we did. And we did in the first service too. But you know what? As I look around, I always see some who still are just, you know, they just are not animated yet. They're not free. Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And I think one of the greatest freedoms is to be free to worship God. You know, uh, we shouldn't be bound up, uh, thinking about ourselves, you know, all bound up, we can't get our hands up, we can't open our mouth. Sometimes we say, okay, just pray out loud, and it just goes quiet. What are we all hung up about? Listen, spirit-filled people have freedom. They sing, they praise, they shout. They're not worried about anything. They're just going for it because the well is overflowing. Hello? And we could use a little bit more of that around here. I'm just telling you. Some people might walk in here and say, oh, wow, that church is so... No, we're not. No, we're not. We're, we're getting there. But there's, believe me, there's a lot more room for freedom and liberty in this house. There's still a lot of people who are just all bound up. And I want you to stand with me this morning because I'm gonna take a few minutes. I wanna pray for you this morning. And I'm not gonna pray for you while you're sitting in your seat. I want you to come forward this morning. If you've never been filled with the Spirit, if you know as we're here and we're talking about this, and you're saying, well, that's not my experience. I've never been filled with the Spirit. Um, I've never had that overflow. I've never experienced that, but I want to. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of bound up. I need more freedom to worship and to pray. And you know, the Holy Spirit is the game changer. I told a very quick story in the first service about when I first got saved, I started going to Christian Bible studies on Monday night. I didn't, I didn't go to church on Sunday. Uh, I was in the sack. I was up by the crack of noon every Sunday morning. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was out Saturday night 
partying. And uh, even after I was born again, and, 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 you know, church was not on the option. I could go Monday nights to a, a Bible study. So I started doing that. But I was working at a hospital, and I bumped into a guy who I knew from my former days. We dodged the law together. I'll just put it that way. And so I saw him. He saw me. We sat down, had lunch. Hey, what's going on with your life? I started telling him right away, I'm a Christian. He goes, well, that's amazing. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm a Baha'i. And I went, a Baha'u? <laughs> I'm a Baha'i. And so I remembered, you know, there's this band, Seals and Crofts, that I used to listen to. Really, I really dug their music. And I remember reading on the back that these guys were Baha'is, which didn't mean anything to me. But he started unpacking. And he said, yeah, like, hey, man, we believe in Jesus and Muhammad and, you know, everybody. Like, they're all, they're all from God, you know. And, and uh, you need to come to a Baha'i meeting. So I started going to Baha'i meetings. So I went to Baha'i meetings for probably about eight or nine months. I was going Monday nights to the Christian Bible study. I was devouring the scripture, but I was reading the Baha'i faith books and devouring all that. And I did not see the difference. Intellectually, the Baha'i faith made a lot more sense to me. It was all about one world government. How many know that's a real good idea? It was all about the unification of mankind. The Bible talks about every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation worshiping before the throne. But the Baha'i faith wants to erase all that. Unification of mankind, we're all one. They have these 12 things. I won't get into them all. But the bottom line is after 12, uh, eight months or so, they said, well, hey, you've read it all. You've been meeting with us all this time. What are you gonna do with this? So I thought, okay, I don't know what to do. And I, they said, well, what you can do is declare Baha'i. And you can fill in this little connect card, put your name and your address and your signature on there that you've declared Baha'i, and we'll send it off to Haifa, to the world, one world uh, Haifa Center, and you'll be registered as a Baha'i. So I said, okay, so I filled it in. And you know, the next day I'm kind of walking down the street, and I'm not sure, you know, did I do the right thing? So there was a church. I was coming up to, and I went over, see if the door's open, it's open. So I went in, you know, I didn't know what was going on. No one there, no one in the church. So I went up to the altar, I knelt down. I said, it was kind of like, you know, there's three doors, will the real God please step out? So it was like, you know, Buddha, Baha'u'llah, Mohammed, Jesus, like, I don't know, just, Show me, tell me, you know, I just want to do the right thing. And so suddenly a scripture dropped into my heart. I couldn't remember if it was in the Bible or if it was in the Baha'i writings. It was in 1 Corinthians 14. It said, God is not the author of confusion. And so I prayed and I said, God, you're not the author of confusion. So if I've made the right decision becoming a Baha'i, I'm not going to have any confusion. I'm going to walk in peace. Amen. Walked out of there. The next morning I woke up, and for two or three days, it was like, I am talking literally, it's literally like a black cloud came over my life. I couldn't tie my shoes. I went to work, and every day that people were looking at me and saying, what is going on with you? I go, I, what do you mean? I said, man, like, you're just screwing everything up. I am? Believe me, I wasn't high on drugs probably the one few days that I wasn't <clears throat> but but you know I just it was just like and finally I remembered after two three days that I prayed this prayer God is not the author of confusion and I was in the deepest confusion that I had been in in a long long time and I immediately renounced the Baha'i faith and I said Jesus I need you now the peace of God came over my life immediately. But I still believed what the Baha'is taught. I still believed it. And so, after a few months I was in church, I finally got hooked up with the church, and I was at the front and they were praying like this for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my pastor came over and he laid hands on me and began to pray for me. And the power of God, just like waves, began to come over me. I found myself speaking in an unknown language. And it was, it was literally like that well. It was just a well flowing out of me. And I haven't stopped since. But the point is, is after I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's when the lights came on 
spiritual understanding flooded my heart and I began to see why I understood why I shouldn't be a Baha'i and why no one else should either. I began to see the deception. I had spiritual understanding. I began to move in spiritual gifts. All of a sudden, it's like I was elevated into another realm with the goodness of God and the power of God. And I wanna tell you folks, this is where the rubber hits the road in Christianity. So if you know that that has not happened to you, or you know that you're all bound up in worship and so on, this message is called Elevate Your Worship Experience. And if you need that, I want you to come forward right now. Just come forward right now. The, the, the front was full in the first service. Just come on up. We just wanna pray for you. Just step out of your seat right now. Don't be shy.